So I'll be presenting the first case, uh, which is that of a duodenal biopsy. Uh, this is the request form that we got. So it was an 11-month-year-old male child uh, who presented with chronic diarrhea. And uh, they wanted us to exclude lymphangiectasia. That was the primary diagnosis, working diagnosis, structural or other GI abnormalities. Now, this is a copy of the endoscopy report that we received. Now, fortunately, in our hospital, uh, we get a copy of the report with all our GI biopsies, which is a very useful thing because there's a lot of information in the endoscopy report, which is not reflected always in the request form. Uh, in this case, uh, there's also this additional history of two sibling deaths, uh, one from pneumonia and one from undiagnosed condition. So uh, let us look at the endoscopy findings in greater detail. The esophagus and stomach are normal and the gastric biopsy also was normal that we which we had received. The changes are in the duodenum. Now in this uh, duodenal cap there are prominent and distended uh, villi and uh, there's a whitish hue and in the second part also there are the prominent villi and this whitish specks. So <clears throat> the impression was prominent villi to exclude lymphangiectasia. Now we'll move on to the digital slides. Uh, digital screen is something like this, where you have all the cases which are in our uh, list are uh, posted, and we can select a case which we would, which we are interested in, and tag it to a special folder. So coming to our slide, our case. This is a digital image, and um, now this is just one x. So at one x, you can see. Even at this uh, magnification, you can make out that the villus height is normal. You can see a finger-like uh, appearance of the villi. And uh, more just zooming on to a higher power, you can see that the enterocytes are slightly pale. Even on this magnification, in some areas, they are normal. And uh, zooming on to further higher magnification, you can make out. See here, the enterocytes are normal. You can see the goblet cells. But in, in, um, in a significant proportion of the biopsy, you can see this baculation of the enterocytes, which is quite significant and giving a very pale appearance. Uh, this is a more higher power view. This is the 10x, where you can see these are the normal. So the changes are not throughout, but occupying a significant proportion of the biopsy. And the baculation is fine. In some areas, it is quite fine. In some areas, it is very subtle, like you can see here, very subtle baculation in this area. And some areas, it is quite striking and significant, the baculation. And this is just a high power view of the same. Here, in some areas, it's normal. And some area, you can see the baculation. The other features in the duodenal biopsy, which we typically look for, uh, like inter increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, uh, parasite, microgranuloma, none of the features were seen. And uh, I did a PAS stain on this. And as you can see that this vacuolation is PAS negative. So it is not mucin which is causing the vacuolation. Uh, so I thought it could possibly be lipid which is causing this micro vacuolation. And uh, with this isolated finding of significant uh, vac fine vacuolation of the enterocytes and no other findings, I thought of uh, A-beta lipoproteinemia. Uh, now, before making such a rare diagnosis and uh, on just a single finding, is, uh, we, we, it, it's advisable to talk to the gastroenterologist before we um, make the diagnosis. So I discussed with uh, the gastroenterologist and he gave me this additional history. He said uh, it was born, the child was born to consanguineous couple, so we could well be dealing with a hereditary condition. And one sister passed away at the age of 10 months due to pneumonia, other sister passed away at the age of 13 months who had similar symptoms. Uh, the second child did have two biopsies, but which were the diagnosis was not made and uh, we didn't know the cause of death in the, the second child was not known. But he said, yeah, A-beta lipoproteinemia is a possibility uh, in the entire clinical context. So this was the diagnosis that I gave. There were significant vacuolation of surface enterocytes and A-beta lipoproteinemia to be considered. I want to emphasize that just 
uh, by seeing this uh, vacuolations, you cannot make a definite diagnosis. You can only suggest it and a definite diagnosis can only be made by genetic analysis. So uh, genetic analysis was done for this child and uh, there was a, a mutation at the MTTP gene and at this site and uh, the diagnosis of A beta lipoproteinemia was confirmed on by genetic analysis and it is autosomal recessive. Now a little bit about this disease that it presents at infancy with diarrhea and vomiting. It's a very rare condition, autosomal recessive in that that both parents are asymptomatic carriers and there are mutations in the M MTP gene. And uh, it affects the fat and vitamin absorption. Patient has uh, low cholesterols and uh, this red cell acanthocytosis can be seen. So that is again another simple test you can ask for if you suspect this disease because of the defects in the cell membrane. It will tell this, uh, uh, this will be the appearance of the red cells. And uh, the child uh, has deficiency of fat soluble vitamins, A, E, K primarily. And uh, this leads to retinitis and gradual vision loss, neuropathy, myopathy in later life. So, uh, does that mean every time you see uh, microvacuolations of the enterocytes, you think of this uh, condition? Not necessary. Uh, you can also find vacuolations in these common conditions like cow's milk sensitivity, juvenile nutritional megaloblastic anemia, celiac, NSAID in injury, tropical sprue. Uh, this was another journal biopsy which I pulled, pulled out. Uh, this was a uh, journal biopsy in an adult who's, uh, who had ulcerative colitis in his colonic biopsies. Uh, and But you can see there's a lot of vacuolation in these enterocytes. But if you look, if you compare the two, you can see the difference even on HNE section. You can see that these vacuolations, as you can still make out that they are clearly quite goblet, they are exaggerated goblet cells. And whereas this, this is our case you can see that it is fine vacuolation sometimes the findings can be subtle and you can only get something like this and sometimes it can be quite significant and point uh, can help you to make the diagnosis much more easily if you have a doubt you can do a pa stain so if it is mucin it will all be pas positive whereas like in our case if it is due to lipids it will be pas negative uh, and now does that mean every time you get vacuolation due to lipids it is A beta again uh, not necessary uh, one must keep in mind especially in adults uh, condition called lipid hang up that is the patient uh, he he eats before his endoscopy and he doesn't really remain in NBM which so in these cases we do find a uh, vacuolation it can be quite fine in the enterocytes so we must keep this in mind before we diagnose this uh, condition there are other two very similar conditions, homozygous hypo beta lipoproteinemia and Anderson's disease or chylomicron retention disease. Uh, both these are also can have a very similar light microscopic uh, finding and um, these can be differentiated from A beta only by um, genetic analysis. So uh, the treatment of this condition is mainly aimed by uh, nutritional repletion so the patient is advised low fat diet and ingestion of fat soluble vitamins so they have to do the cooking with medium chain fatty acids that coconut oil can be used for the cooking but no ghee or other oils and uh, lots and lots of vitamin E A K is given to these patients so almost four times normal requirement the long-term outcome is difficult to predict. It all depends on uh, the dietary restriction that is followed. And um, uh, but overall, the prognosis is not very good. Uh, so the reason I presented this case was uh, one thing: it's a rare condition, and uh, just one has to pay attention to the cytoplasm of the enterocytes because sometimes this fine vacuolation can be quite subtle and can be missed. And if you do see it, then you can alert the clinician to the possible disease in the appropriate clinical context. That is also very important. Uh, uh, one should not make the diagnosis in adults. 
and uh, of course you can only alert them that this is a possibility and uh, a genetic study will only confirm the diagnosis.